What was life really like for the Aboriginal Australians? And how were they so successful for thousands and thousands of years? Didgeridoos, boomerangs, and an ancient hunter-gatherer lifestyle. These tend to be the first things to come to mind when we imagine Indigenous Australians. I would certainly say that is the thought that I would have had. Uh, may, that may have changed slightly now, but before I started learning about Australia, I would have thought they were very primitive, hunter-gatherers at most. And I don't think that was the case, as we're probably about to find out. Only with the arrival of the Europeans was agriculture introduced, but new research and old documents may reveal the secrets of native Australian agriculture. So were the Aboriginals just hunter-gatherers? Did they take part in an ancient secret whale-human alliance? And did they manage the largest estate on earth? Well, let's find out. When the explorer Thomas Mitchell first travelled around Australia in the 1830s, he noted, We crossed a beautiful plain, covered in shining verdure, and ornamented with trees, which, although drooped in nature's careless haste, gave the country the appearance of an extensive park. It gives us a beautiful image of what the Australian wilderness would have looked like before the first European settlers arrived. Only, there's something slightly wrong with this image. It's false. False. Nature hadn't turned the country into a park. The indigenous people had. Depopulation by disease and the appetites of sheep has eliminated most of the visible evidence of native agriculture. So we'll have to heavily rely on the reports of early explorers and settlers to understand pre-contact agriculture. Andrew Todd, an early Australian settler, was left to guard the food stores at Indented Head, Victoria in 1835. In order to pass the time during this very boring assignment, Todd spent time with the local Watharong people. His Can I just say, I, I, I find it incredible that there were so many different Aboriginal people, tribes, um, areas that all had the different names, had their different territories almost. So straight away that makes me think, well, they must have had some sort of social structure. They must have had communication with other other Aboriginal people as well, That which they had their own land you know each each different um type of people had their own land so that must show a little bit more you know they weren't just hunter gatherers in that aspect of things sketches of their lives give us a small insight into aboriginal agriculture one sketch shows a line of women digging for morong tubers a native yam which is now almost extinct the area where the women are working is perfectly cleared in a manner that would make harvesting much more efficient, in a similar manner to how modern farmers maintain their fields. Other explorers, such as Mitchell, noted similar behaviours elsewhere. At Cooper's Creek, it was documented that the natives reaped millet in fields of over a thousand acres, cutting down the stalks with stone knives. On the Arnhem coast, the parsnip yam was particularly important. When yams were dug out, the top of the tuber was left still attached to the tendril in the ground, so the yam would grow again. Really grow. The fact that settlers report stuff like this over and over again shows that this wasn't an isolated technique. Cultivation wasn't a bug, it was a feature of Aboriginal land use. It makes you then think, well, how did they know to do that? I suppose we could say, well, how do we know to do what we can do, the, the, the farming techniques? But if these... Bear in mind, this was small amounts of groups, like, sorry, lots of groups, but very small... Uh, amount of people in each group right well how then is the knowledge gained from each individual group or how is the knowledge passed to other groups that seems to be the most logical way that actually they all talk they all communicate um, to each other within different languages but the knowledge is passed from one group to another maybe completely wrong but how did they do it in the first place? How did they know what to do in the first place? The Aboriginals had managed the land in a way that maintained the quality of the soil, through the use of burning down portions of the forest, planting trees in strategic locations, and harvesting crops in a way that did not drain the soil's nutrients. This process led early colonists like Edward Page to remark, When I first came here, I started a vegetable garden, and the soil dug like ashes. The constant stomping of newly arrived sheep and cattle destroyed the carefully managed earth and compacted the once soft soil. Now rains bounced off it 
and rivers flooded higher than Aboriginals had ever seen. The Aboriginal methods of land management were not just practical, but also pretty. Clearing the land, planting trees in neat rows, and managing soil built that landscape that Mitchell described as an extensive park. There are so many of these examples of Aboriginals managing the land that Norman Tyndale was able to draw this map of indigenous grain areas, which stretched out across the continent. I won't tell you what it looks like. Just take a look. Sorry. The native people would take seeds from one area and bring them to others where they did not occur naturally. They could trade them for other goods and services, as well as simply giving them as gifts. Selecting seeds and moving them across such distances over long periods of time slowly changed them, resulting in some of the plants taking on the attributes of domesticated plants. Hmm. Thomas Mitchell stated, In the neighbourhood of our camp, the grass had been pulled to a very great extent and piled in hayricks, extending for miles, that had evidently been thus laid up by the natives. But for what purpose, we could not imagine. It wasn't until 100 years later that researchers figured out that the hayricks were being used to ripen the seeds in the grass, which were then collected, cleaned, stored and used to make bread. Through seed selection, precise planting and weeding, the Aboriginals created crops that thrived in Australia's harsh climate, like the bush tomato, used by the central desert people for thousands of years. It has become dependent on people for its survival and spread, Surplus harvests were rolled up into balls that could be stored for years. Professor Ian Shivers argues that in Australia we have stunning examples of very long-term grain food production that had no degrading impact on the environment, that did not require extensive fertilizers or pesticides and grew without the need for irrigation water. Uh, that's incredible, isn't it? The fact that, for example, in our country, we're having to use fertilizers and, uh, and pesticides to get the best out of our fruit, you know, so we can get plentiful amounts. But thousands of years ago, uh, not even thousands, but less than that, but, you know, the Aboriginal people were able to do it successfully, keep the soil full of nutrients, rotating. And, and we, with the technology we've got now, need to use the enhancers to, to, to you know and these guys didn't it's just bizarre it's absolutely bizarre and and incredible that, that these guys who didn't have the technology could do what they could do i think it's fascinating the delicate science of baking popped up along with these harvests we've discovered grindstones at cuddy springs in new south wales that are over thirty thousand years old Wow. making the Aboriginals the world's oldest bakers. In the reed marshes near Swan Hill, James Kirby was intrigued by massive mounds dotting the landscape. From what he could see, they were emitting steam. He discovered that they were in fact gigantic ovens used for cooking. In this harsh land, the Aboriginal people produced a surplus, and surplus food production is one of the characteristics of agriculture. They had to take advantage of every niche possible in order to do this. They grew the nardo plant because it could grow in the beds of shallow lakes in otherwise inhospitable regions. As the lakes dried, explorers observed aboriginals sweeping the seeds into huge piles and processing it into flour. Many explorers only barely survived their journeys after borrowing from these native stockpiles. John Davies, a member of one of the search parties for the famous Burke and Wills expedition, reported of the huge quantities of nardo seed he saw in the Sturzalicki Desert, reminding us that desert is really just a place where Europeans can grow wheat and sheep. Everything was preserved, from moths all the way to fish. Preserved caterpillars were made into a kind of flour, and figs and quandong were pulped and mixed into an edible paste. Large grain stores of more than 50 kilos were preserved in animal skins. The Aboriginals developed a system that allowed them to harvest from their environment without placing too much stress on it. This produced incredible results for them. Under this system, the Australian Alps became a huge food producer due to the summer arrival of massive numbers of Bogong moths. Clans such as the Manero, Bidwell, Nagarigo, Yuan, Tawa, Diringanj, Walbanga and the Nunganawal, which I have butchered all the names of, <laughs> came together from across the continent to harvest these moths. Huge quantities of moths were collected from crevices in the rocks, captured with nets or swept up into kangaroo skins. The body was eaten 
or ground into a paste and made into doughy cakes which were then smoked to preserve them. Mmm, smoked moth paste, my favourite. Yummy. Settlers, and I'm not joking here, described aboriginals returning from the moth harvest with their bodies glistening with moth fat. When they weren't glistening with moth fat, the aboriginals were using fire to manage their environment. I, 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 all these things. Now, bear in mind, I don't think they had paper. They didn't have pen, pencil, paper, did they? So if you think all this knowledge over thousands of years has been gets passed down from generation to generation, new things get learned as well along the way. So it's all through... Uh, communication, uh, it's all through teaching. None of it is written down. That's another thing I find incredible. Where would we be now without pen and paper to be able to explain to people how to do things? I don't think we would. Um, and that makes it even more incredible because as as they meet new new Aboriginal tribes, they can then pass on the knowledge and that new knowledge starts elsewhere. Uh, it's I, 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 it's hard to comprehend almost. That's what I think. With with the world that we live in now, it's almost so difficult to comprehend how they did it at the time. Early reporters assumed that the burnings were a simple hunting method, but it appears that they were using the fires to create a section of cleared land and forest as part of a plan to maximise resources. They would position drinking wells between kangaroo zones and growing zones to provide all the needs for the animals so that they would have no reason to enter areas dedicated to crops. They had created this kind of psychological fence. Fire controlled where the animals and trees would be, which made hunting much more effective and predictable, while at the same time keeping animals away from the crops. Within years of the aboriginals being prevented from burning, the countryside was overrun with weed species. What had once been attractive pasture transformed into shrubland in a matter of years. You see, the settlers disliked fire. It threatened their houses, their cattle, and their crops. But it was this careful use of fire that made the land so attractive to them in the first place. By constantly managing their environment, the Aboriginals built up a deep knowledge of the plant and animal life around them. And they used this knowledge to their advantage. For example, there is this incredible traditional whaling story recorded by the ethnographer Robert H. Matthews. When the natives saw a whale being chased by killer whales, one of the old men would pretend to be weak and slow to make the killer whales feel bad for him, and then the man would call on the killer whales to bring the chased whale ashore. When the injured whale drifted onto the beach, the other men came out of hiding to kill the whale. This ritual with killer whales encouraged the whales to chase even larger whales ashore, where they would be harvested by the Yun people, who would then share the feast not just with the neighbouring clans, but also with the killer whales who would receive the tongue, which was apparently their favourite part. <laughs> Whether there was an actual connection between the people and the whales is up for debate. Surely that is not true. Surely the, the, they're so far out in, in the sea that they wouldn't even have a clue that the people were there. If that is true, that is incredible. Absolutely incredible. But it appears that the Aboriginals understood how to constantly turn their fragile ecosystem to their advantage. This continued up until European whalers began to hunt and harm the whales. This severed the ancient human-whale alliance, but prophecy states that a child will be born of both races that will one day reunite our broken worlds. Their alliance with the whales wasn't the only aquatic achievements of the Aboriginals. They were also experts in aquaculture. Thomas Mitchell witnessed massive fish traps on the Darling River at Briwarina. Some claim that these are the oldest man-made structures on Earth. The rocks wow. surrounded pools across a great distance. Fish were then herded in through the small openings which the natives would then shut with another rock. The pools are at different heights so they can be used when different water levels occur, making them resistant to the area's frequent floods and droughts. Quite how old these structures are is unclear. Locals claim that they are over 40,000 years old. In a 1984 survey, Jeanette Hope and Gary Vines said the traps were most likely built during a period of a low water level, sometime between 19,000 and 3,000 years ago. Either way, they're super old. Upon seeing similar stone arrangements at Lake Conda, George Augustus Robinson remarked, 
an immense piece of ground, trenched and banked, resembling the work of civilized man, but which on inspection I found to be the work of the aboriginal natives. His findings didn't gel with the early colonists who wanted to see the natives as nomadic barbarians. My mind is completely blown. My mind is completely blown. You can almost think how primitive people were even hundreds of years ago. Um, and now to see that thousands of years ago, the Aboriginal people were using these techniques, which I wouldn't have even thought of. I wouldn't have even thought of, if you're trying to survive, I wouldn't have even thought of that way, building the trenches to catch fish. Thousands of years ago, thousands of years ago, and it's hard to comprehend, as I said, but wow. I don't even know how to react to this because it is so impressive that these guys and girls and children had this knowledge and, and were able to do it. And like they, like they say, you know, when the, when the settlers came over, they wanted to think that these aboriginals were just, were just hunter gatherers. They were basic. They were simple. They didn't have any sort of socialized way of life. Uh, and, and, they were barbarians, basically, but they weren't. So it was either ignored or seen as evidence of irrigation by a superior, ancient, white and now lost race. Heavy rains in 1977 revealed how Aboriginal-made channels fed water and eels into natural depressions termed holding ponds. In addition, a number of stone structures, possibly villages, were recorded in the same area as the fish traps. So if these were a fishing system and some stone structures located nearby were houses, then according to archaeologist Heather Bilf, then around 10,000 people lived a more or less settled life in this town. If such large populations lived there, then the demand for food would be incredible. They must have preserved it all somehow. Bilf turned to the hollow trees nearby. She could see immediately that these had all been used as fireplaces. And an analysis of the soil at their bases revealed eel fat. The local Gundi Jamara people assisted her the entire way. They knew all along what these structures were, but had never been asked. Together, they came to the conclusion that the traps were about 8,000 years old. Indigenous Australian religion prescribed that people leave the world as they found it. Each family cared for its own ground and knew how fire affected each species, along with each animal's connection to the Aboriginal dream time. They had a deep knowledge of every inch and knew well the lands of neighbours and other nations, sharing larger scale management and preservation of the land. They travelled to and from managed resources and made them not just sustainable, but convenient, abundant and predictable. They understood that the life of the clan relied on the quality of the land, which caused an underlying conservationist mindset a concern for future people they would never meet. By re-examining how we view the Aboriginal people and how they manage the land, it can help us think of new solutions to how we currently manage our resources. Ironically, by shaping the land carefully for grazing animals, they pave the way for colonists. The more carefully they manage the land, the more attractive it looked. Their methods made it appear to Europeans that the land wasn't used, when in fact, it was a nearly completely man-made environment. The Aboriginals didn't farm in the same way as the people of Africa, Eurasia or the Americas did. But the people currently living on the continent should be thankful that they didn't. The way they managed the land allowed it to be fertile for over 40,000 years. In the last 200, Australia has lost more than 50 animal and plant species and recorded the highest rate of mammalian extinction in the world. I knew that the the British settlers did damage in, in the in the sense of bringing their diseases and illnesses and, uh, and and treating Aboriginal people badly. And I didn't know about how bad this side of things, the wildlife, the the, the way that the the land has been changed from well managed to less so. I, I think it I think I don't clearly I don't think that the Aboriginal people are given enough credit. 
uh, if, if all this is true, then what incredible people for thousands of years were able to do to Australia. Luckily, we still have a people and a continent to learn from and work with. Hopefully, in the following years, we can learn more about the Indigenous Australians and how they groomed a continent-sized park. I hope you enjoyed this video. Wow, what a what brilliant, brilliant video. An incredible video that I didn't, I, I didn't appreciate the... As I said at the start, I would have thought that the Aboriginal people were simply hunter-gatherers. Very simple, very basic. And that now sounds quite offensive because for thousands of years, the knowledge was gained and passed down to generation to generation. They were able to create complex environment, but keep the land well maintained and organized to keep the nutrition in the soil. I think it is incredible. The way that they were able to catch fish wasn't a way that I would have even thought of. Aboriginal people do clearly need to be learnt from. The, the damage that that is being done all around the world from from farming through f through meat um, even to f f for um, for things like crops the damage that is being done is not good and I think most people should be able to agree with that maybe these guys are who we need to learn from these Aboriginals were able to create something from nothing almost um, in a in a in a well managed way, and the the whole thing of leaving something as you wish someone else to find it is a, is a huge thing I think, and and a lot of people need to learn from that. Incredible! Uh, what a brilliant brilliant video! Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it too. Make sure you like and subscribe, and I will catch you next time.